prove that I do have a husband. <laughs> anyway, uh, he is Jim Davis. He actually writes under the name J. Madison Davis. He has written, he gave me a bio, actually. <laughs> so I'm going to cheat here. He's written eight novels. His first novel, The Murder of Frau Schutz, was nominated for an Edgar, which is the big award that the Mystery Writers of America give out every year. Um, he's written seven other mysteries. He has written, what, seven nonfiction books, a lot of articles and reviews, and he writes all the time. He's a, he's a wonderful writer, he's a great teacher, and I think you're gonna learn a lot from him, so. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Don't believe a word of it. Okay. <laughs> I didn't do it. No. Uh, um, I thought I thought tonight I would uh, tell you a story. Uh, basically, it's a story of how I got published. But it had there are a number of points along the way about about um, about the nature of of writing and and working at writing. Um, and you know, and, and we'll have a question period as well, so so you can ask whatever, whatever you like. Um, well, you know, someone says, "Well, how did you how did you start writing?" And I always say, "Well, well, I was always imagining things and writing them down and inventing things." But my, my family was not of the uh, upper income category, so I never really thought of it as any kind of occupation. It just seemed to be something I did for entertainment and fun. I read a lot and so on like that. But um, my objective or originally was to be a scientist, whatever that means, and, and um, um, I, I got interested in archeology span in particular uh, and I think uh, you know when I found out later that uh, that Kurt Vonnegut was a was an anthropology major, I thought, well, that's appropriate. We're interested in people and their behaviors. You know, that's what novelists are interested in. If you're not interested in that, you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, the curiosity of people, understanding how they think, and that sort of thing. Uh, I ended up at the University of Maryland during, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, riots about the Vietnam War, and um, and the I was taking anthropology and majoring in anthropology, but I started taking a lot of writing courses uh, simply because I enjoyed them and comparative literature and and a number of things like that. Um, I then uh, 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 worked for a while and then decided that uh, I would go up to Johns Hopkins and get my uh, master's degree in the writing seminars. Well, that program was a very literary program, you know, and uh, I can't say that it did a lot for me. <laughs> I mean, I met, I met some people, it influenced, it, it wasn't, wasn't very encouraging because I hadn't yet discovered uh, what I was sort of suited to write, and this is, this is one of the things you have to discover for yourself as well. Uh, everybody has has a you know a different uh, axe to grind, I guess, and um, and they have to find out what their particular axe is. Is it double bladed? Is it single bladed? Is it is it uh, is it uh, is this or is it that? Um, but during this process, I wrote a lot of short stories, lots of short stories, uh, many different types. Um, and um, uh, ultimately, uh, while, the, uh, while I was at Johns Hopkins, I think it was when I got my first story got published, and it got published in Canada, of all places, um, um, because it had some bilingual aspects to it. I had to, it was sort of a monologue of, a, of an insane man who, who crossed over into French once in a while uh, and, and confused things uh, it was kind of a murder mystery, though I didn't realize it at the time. Um, I, you know, it'll seem kind of dense that I was stumbling along, not realizing that I was moving toward writing mysteries on all of this. I just thought I was writing, you know? Um, I had even written a lot of poetry, which is a sad tale of a, you know, poetry is sort of a childhood disease you have to get over. <laughs> <laughs> Because nobody wants it. Nobody cares. 
<laughs> you know, and uh, and I actually had sent some off, and uh, the, the you know the, I started to think I was cursed. I sent some off, and uh, someone said, "Oh, this is wonderful, but I only publish books of poetry. Um, uh, do you have enough for a book?" Well, you know, a couple days later, I did. You know, I just, <laughs> and and sent it off, and signed contracts, and got a trip to Chicago, and then got a trip to New York when they moved the publishing house. And then I heard nothing for a long, long time and finally found out that the publisher, this was a one-woman operation, she died. <laughs> I don't know whether poetry had anything to do with that, but, uh, um, uh, you know, it was the beginning of a string of, of strange luck. Um, it, it went on. I published short stories. I... I, uh, I went and I got a PhD at, at uh, Southern Mississippi, which had a very good writing program, and, um, and, uh, and I learned a lot there. Uh, the main, main person in charge was a guy named Frederick Barthelme. He was a brother of Donald Barthelme, who was a big literary star at the time. Frederick Barthelme was, uh, had originally been an artist and so he wasn't full of the sort of normal terms that, that you get in writing programs. You know, he didn't say, oh, your characterization is weak or something like that. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, yeah, yeah. it didn't really mean anything. He, he had this weird way of speaking, you know. He would say, he would say well, it's sort of like his dog goes around a corner, you know, and turns into a drugstore, you know, and you'd say... <laughs> And, so, and you try to figure out what this had to do with your story at all. And some people really hated him, I'm going to tell you this. Um, um, but I would sit there and think, and all of a sudden I'd go, oh, yeah, you know. I remember one time, that drugstore thing, he said, he said, uh, so what you need is a guy to go around the corner and turn into a drugstore. And he says, why would he go to the drugstore? He said, no, no, no. He doesn't go in the drugstore. He turns into a drugstore. <laughs> this did, had no effect on the guy who was coaching. You know, it was like, but for some reason, all of this was kind of working very. And and the important thing about his attitude to writing was it was largely uh, he looked at it from a very sort of technical point of view. You know that that uh, which which a lot of people really didn't like because it takes all the romanticism out of it. Oh, my soul is enlarged and I have something to say. You know, it's like no 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 no. You know, it, it's a it's a how are you going to say it? How are you going to line up the words? Why is this word in that sentence? It doesn't do anything. You know. And it, it creates a different way of thinking about it. It gives you, of course, you want to be inspired and, you know, all of that. You want to express your feelings. But his point was you can't express them unless you do it in a way that, that conveys it. And that, and that it's difficult to do that. It's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do that. Well, I'm I'm writing along. I've tried a novel. I tried a, more. I'm publishing some short stories, and then, and I'm thinking I got to write a novel. I got to write a novel. You know. Well, uh, life is weird. You know. I'm I'm at this campus in northwestern Pennsylvania, and a guy comes in one day, and he says, uh, one of my fellow teachers, and he says, he says, I'm going to get a book contract. I'm going to get a book contract, and I said, I said, really? You know? He says, yes. He said, he said, I said, have you written? You know, can I read the novel or something? He says, oh no, it isn't written yet. <laughs> well, you have to understand how incredibly weird that is. I mean, unless you're Stephen King or James Patterson or somebody. Uh, Truman Capote, supposedly the last few years of his life, lived on book contracts that he never fulfilled. You know, he go into a publisher and say, I'm thinking about writing a book about the Eiffel Tower. And they go, here, money, you know. And he'd go off and spend it uh, <laughs> and never deliver the book. And they really would, didn't want to sue him because it would be embarrassing. So, uh, you know, basically they were sustaining him that way. Um, well, he, you know, if he, if he even thought about writing another In Cold Blood, you would, 
you know, <laughs> he would want to have a, a percentage in, in on that. Well, this friend of mine, he says, uh, he says, yeah, I've got a, he says, I had a great idea for a book, high concept. Well, I'm too good for high concept, that kind of thing. But yeah, and the high concept was a woman sells her soul to the devil for success in the pharmaceutical industry. And I went, what? <laughs> You got to be kidding me! No, yeah, no. I get I get one quarter of the money when I get to, you know, at one quarter written, another half, another payment, and then then I'm full. And I I said, uh, who was publishing this? You know, and it turned out that two uh, editors had left a major publisher. I don't remember which one it was, and found it at their own house. Okay, so they were starting it, and they had uh, plucked this out of nowhere. They, they uh, got him, you know, the hardback rights, paperback rights, movie rights, uh, and, all, you know, just all at once. And he was, you know, adding a wing to his house and hadn't even finished this thing, <laughs> which basically consisted of, and when he finally got around to reading it, uh, he says, he says, a woman sells her soul to the devil, right? And get this. The title is Ms. Faust, you know, and I'm going, oh, you know, I, I'm thinking this is this is ridiculous. But but uh, and then when I read the book, it was even more ridiculous because basically it was, uh, you know, she she wants to be promoted, so some guy takes a uh, fall down an elevator shaft, and then the devil shows up and and wants to have sex, and they'll have sex for three or four pages. And then, and then, and then she'll need another promotion, you know. And uh, and this guy will choke to death at the at the you know company banquet. Uh, it was just you know it was awful. But uh, but it was high concept, which meant they thought they could do something with it. Well, I said uh, uh, I have an idea for a book. Do you think your agent, you know, because I've been trying to get an agent all along. If your agent is access publishers the big publishers don't even read books anymore they don't they just rely on agents to to not send them terrible stuff you know uh so that if you're an amateur uh, you know you've never you've never been heard of before or anything like that um they they just kind of politely in fact some publishers say they will shred your book if you just send it in without an agent. I mean, they literally, well, they said, we don't have time for it, and, and that's that. In the old days, you know, 30s and 40s, they did. They had people who read through everything that was submitted. So, but, but not since the 70s do they, they do this. They just let the agent, they just assume an agent won't try to ruin his career by sending in terrible stuff. Well, uh, I said, do you think, you know, because I had this idea. I had been kind of, you know, kind of building the idea about, you know, a murder that takes place in a place where a murder is not even interesting, you know. And, uh, you know, I, was, I thought about it, maybe science fiction, maybe this, maybe that. And then I suddenly thought it's a concentration camp. There's a murder in a concentration camp, and somebody is sent to investigate it, and eventually sort of worked it all out with a guy sent to investigate it. It's not an investigator. He seems to be being sent for some political reason by, by the Third Reich in order to, I, you know, do what? Cover up his murder, make it look like it was investigated, whatever it was. And I thought uh, this was an interesting idea. So. So I kind of wrote up a chapter and an outline uh, of, of the book and sent it to my friend's agent. He was a big deal agent, too. I mean, six figures was normal for him to deal with and fool with. Well, he sort of said, oh, it's a great idea. I love it. But then he said, but it's the kind of book you have to write first. <laughs> uh, you couldn't just, couldn't just sell it on You just couldn't contract it on it. You know, because fiction... Uh, the general rule on fiction, which was surprising about his contract, but the general rule on fiction is it's almost 
as important how it's written as what the story is. Uh, if you if you go at this at any amount of time, read a lot of books, you're going to find the same story told over and over again. You know, but it's all about how it's told or how it's twisted or whose point of view it comes from, something like that. You know, how many murder mysteries a guy's on vacation and. In, uh, in uh, Naples, you know, and then he, he goes down to dinner and there's somebody dead and only 10 people in the room could, you know, you've seen, you know, it's nothing, you know, it's Murder, She Wrote, it's, it's Hercule Poirot, some of, them, some of the versions of the stories are good, some of them are lousy, some of them are, are uh, you know, it, it depends so much on, on the way that fiction is written for people to, to decide whether to enjoy it or not. Well, uh, so he said, I have to write the book. Well, I went crazy. I locked myself in a room, and I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. I thought, oh, no, it's a big-time agent. He's interested in da, da, da. I get 300 pages of this thing. Done. I mail it to him and wait and wait. And I thought, oh, God. You know, and you go through, oh, it must have been lousy. I wrote it lousy. You know, because when you're writing, uh, you're not really sure you're doing the right thing. You know, you're kind of constantly questioning yourself. Uh, at some point, you have to say, oh, what the heck, and you just write it. You know, they don't like it, they don't like it. I'm going to make it as good as I can. But, but uh, you know, when you're first, first doing this, it's like, oh, I failed. Oh, woe is me. And um, and then finally, you know, you say, well, how, have I waited long enough to sort of bug him about it, you know? And I call up, and I always get his assistant, you know, and his assistant always says, well, um, oh, he's very interested in it, but he hasn't gotten to it yet. You know, oh, it's been crazy around here. We've been so busy, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, uh, and I, finally, after you know two months or something, I called up and said, Is it, "Has he has he had a chance to look at the book yet?" And he says, "Well, he hurt his back, you know." And I, I said, "The book's not that heavy. Come on, you know, <laughs> he could at least flip the pages, you know." Well, it dragged on, it dragged on, month after month after month. You have to you have to be patient. Sometimes they really are busy. You know, they get tons of manuscripts, or they get taxes they have to do or whatever it is and you just have to have some patience but it's hard to have it well I'm, I'm going along and I, and I went to a writer's colony now writer's colonies there aren't too many of them anymore but there was one in Virginia called the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts uh, it was originally located in Prospect Hill the you know the mansion and restaurant out there which is a great place to eat um, and and I, I it it had then then moved to across the street from Street Sweetbriar, and um, went down there and met a lot of people. Now it's really a great thing. Uh, writers like to get together with other writers because what you have to realize that what you're doing is so weird <laughs> compared to ordinary life. You know, you lock yourself in a room and you think of various ideas about this, that, and the other, and, and you write and write, and you're not sure it's working, and you throw a bunch of stuff out, and you put a, you know, you push the delete button over and over. But, um, uh, you know, and it's hard for anybody who doesn't write regularly to understand this, to understand what it's like. You know, people imagine, you know, all they, all they know about writing is what they see in the movies, you know. Guy has an idea. Oh, look, my book's finished. And usually in movies, they hold up a, uh, what they hold up is a screenplay. They don't actually hold up a book. So it's about 100 pages, you know. Well, that would make about a 50-page book, you know. It's ridiculous. A real manuscript is, you know, a good 300 pages, double space. And so uh, they've always got it wrong in the movie. Uh, I finished my novel. Well, gee, that must have taken an hour. You know, uh, and a lot of movies I've seen seem to have taken an hour. Uh, so um, um, I got it completed. He didn't read it. Uh, I'm at this writer's colony, and a guy says, um, 
a guy who he was working as an ed he was an editor, not a main editor, but an, a lower editor at Vogue or Gentleman's Quarterly. Uh, I can't remember which one he was at at the time. And he he had had an agent who got enthusiastic about his idea, and and was going and he actually got a you know uh, uh, he had to write write the book. He got a contract on a, on an unfinished book. Uh, he didn't get no. He, I'm sorry, that, that, that's wrong. He got this major agent, a guy named S who who was named Swifty Lazar. This guy was like a huge agent for movies and everything. And if basically Swifty Lazar walked in office and said, "Hey," and they went money, you know, and and uh, Michael had uh, had come up with an idea that he would might write a male version of the group which you may remember, the Mar Mary McCarthy novel about, uh, about college classmates who, who go on and have very soap opera lives. But, but, uh, but he was gonna write a male version of it uh, taking place out of Yale. And all oh, that, that was high concept too. Ooh, so, so Boudreau, uh, Michael Boudreau, he said to me, um, I'd like you to read my your, my manuscript and give me your comments or something. Anything? I said sure. I said, but you got to read mine then, you know. And he said, yeah, sure, you know. So, so nothing happens. And it goes on. More time passes, and then uh, suddenly a guy calls me up and he says, I'm an agent. Do you have an agent yet? And I said, I said no. And he said, well. I went to a party in New York. I've just, I used to be an editor and I became an agent. And I went to a party in New York and I met Michael Boudreau. And I said to him, I'm gonna be an agent now, I'm giving up editing. He said, do you know any good writers? And Boudreau said, uh, I just read this book last night. That's good. And uh, it was my book. This is, you know, I'm glad people go to cocktail parties. You know, what can I tell you? And the guy uh, took it out, and it took about another year before he found a publisher who would take it. And the publisher who took it was uh, Walker. Walker specialized in mysteries and science fiction. Uh, they were the first publisher of John le Carre, for one thing. They published a small town in, what's it called? A small town in Germany. and and I think it's Call for the Dead. I may not have the title right, but it's the first two books by John Le Carre's third novel was The Spy Who Came In From the Coal, and Walker couldn't afford him anymore, you know, so that was that. But uh, Walker's now out of business. The owner uh, drowned uh, in, in Long Island Sound while kayaking, uh, and, and it gradually sort of fell apart without his leadership. So uh, they edited a book. I'm thrilled. They're going to bring it out, and it was a coincidence. I was at the uh, at the Virginia Center again when he actually called me and said I got a contract, uh, and I said really, you know, I didn't know quite what to make of this, but um, again, it's sort of luck, you know. But now the funny thing is, you know, when you talk to writers and write, writers, how do you you ask a writer how do you get published? Well, they always have some version of, of, of uh, their own experience, you know, and, and these things are much more happenstance. I mean, I've known people who, uh, oh, uh, he was working as a chauffeur, and he accidentally left his manuscript in the back seat, and the person who sat down back there was, a, was an editor. Uh, you know, and I said, how does that happen? That's weird, you know, I mean, you know, you just, you, you know, it's just, it's just, I've, other people have done the conventional thing, you know, mailed out samples and da, 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 da. The important thing is you have to keep writing and keep producing stuff and keep saying, so that somehow one of these weird connections between the dots happens, you know. Um, the other side of it, of course, is you have to write well enough to get noticed but you got to understand, you know, one time I called up my current agent and he said, I said, uh, uh, how are you doing? He said, God, I got the flu. 
I got the flu. I'm awful. He said, I see, he said I'm, I'm sitting here going through piles of manuscripts that have been submitted to me. I said, I said, uh, well, that doesn't sound like a fun way to get through the flu. He said, but I, I thought that if there was even the slightest spark in something with the flu, when I have the flu, it's got to be really good. <laughs> He's waiting through these piles and piles of things, <laughs> just saying if it, if it even goes, whew, you know, then, then, then okay, okay, there's that. Well, I, I, uh, I called up the office one day, and, and uh, the publisher, and they said, uh, uh, we have nominated you for the Ed Carolyn Poe Prize. And I said, uh, oh, thanks, you know, that's nice, you know, what is it, you know? And uh, uh, I, I found out and said, oh, that would be cool, you know, but, you know, don't, don't waste your energy on hoping for things that are remote anyway. And a month or two passed, and I called up, and he said, oh, uh, you're nominated for the Edgar Allan Poe Prize. And I said, uh, I, know you, I know you told me, thanks. You know. He said, no, 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 you're nominated. <laughs> that means you're in the top five. You have to get a tux. <laughs> you know? So I got a tux, went to the dinner, watched the other guy win. <laughs> Now, I, I'll tell you this, this, this too, and I, I, you know, I'm not ashamed of this. There were five books. I read one other book uh, from, of the five. I just didn't have time or whatever. I just didn't, and I was teaching and everything. And I read the book, and I said, well, I got him. I, I, and I, I, I say, this is what's wrong with the book, you know? Uh, did it, did it, did it, did it. And uh, it won. <laughs> and uh, you know, and okay, it won. Now, here's what was interesting about it: it managed to get a movie contract. It managed to be made for television movie, made for television movie. But the exact things that I thought were wrong with it were straightened up or removed by the screenwriter, right? The problem was the book was, a, to me, this was the problem of the book. The book was a story of, um, based upon the youngest man who was ever hanged for murder. And he was a black kid in South Carolina, 14, and he was hanged. Um, he, he was charged with killing a white girl, of course, and, and uh, most people really didn't believe he'd done it. He just, he just, you know, he got interrogated with the rubber hose and, you know, and all that stuff. Okay, so it was a bad old story. Well, the guy took the, took the story and made it into a novel. And in the novel, there's a New York reporter who, uh, who has come from the South. His family has come from the South. And he goes back to investigate this old crime, right? But this is what I thought was wrong with the book. First half of the book was hanging the poor guy, you know? And, and you knew where it was going. You knew what was happening. You knew it was a railroad job. They were going to hang this kid no matter what. And then the book started up with the investigation of the murder. Well, in this movie, which starred Lou Gossett Jr., by the way, um, it starts with him beginning to look into this. So in other words, the problem is the structure of it. The problem is the first part of it, you know what's going on. It's, it's, there's no interest. There's no interest. The only interest is in the second half of the book. So by bridging over it this way, the screenwriter took care of it. Now, I want to say something about this. I mean, that, that what a lot of people uh, don't appreciate if they want to write novels and so forth is that they can learn an awful lot from screenwriting. Uh, get a book on screenwriting. You don't have to do the screenwriting, but you have to understand that that movies are made are very structural. You know, A causes B causes C causes D causes E, and it goes all the way out. It's like a train on one track, and it's going. You know. Uh, you might have a couple of tracks across each other once in a while. Novels are more fluid in this way. But the thing is that you know you've got to build up to a resolution and all these kinds of things. 
The problem with a lot of fiction is that, that we we tend to uh, think that we can do anything we want. Well, you can. It's just not very interesting. That's a, <laughs> you have to. There's a certain amount of discipline involved in it, you know. Um, uh, and and um, one of the surprising things to discover is, is I don't know if uh, you know who's who's read Aristotle's Poetics. But Aristotle wrote this little book about how tragedy works. And he wrote it, uh, you know, 400 BC or wherever, 300, 400, thereabouts, give or take a few. And, um, uh, and he describes the structure of plot. And you can't find a screenwriting book that doesn't basically say the same things he says in slightly different ways. Uh, that that you have to have you know a main character and an antagonist and you you have to you know there has to be a, a conflict et cetera et cetera et cetera et cetera all these kind of things if you read it in the right spirit it's it's an incredibly valuable bit about how to set up the story and what to leave out too uh, and, and and so and as I say most most screenwriting books, I don't care who they're by, Lou Hunter or whoever, they, they at some place in the back say, oh, by the way, read the poetics. Uh, read this 2,000-year-old book before they could even imagine what a movie would be, and it's a perfect book about screenwriting. Uh, uh, and it, you know, it, it has some weird stuff, too. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, now... Also, I mean, it's important to, to uh, when you, you know, to do a lot of reading, to find out how other people do it. But this is different from the reading that most people do. Most people read for entertainment. If you want to be a writer, you have to read to see what the tricks are. You know, you have to see what the magician is doing here. You know, this is an incredibly powerful scene. Why? You know, what did this person do that I'm not doing, you know? Or how can I mimic this and make it, still make it original, you know? Um, um, I had one professor who used to say, well, you need to read with a pencil. <laughs> Meaning that you'd say, you'd say, hey, that's a beautiful sentence, you know? Why is it beautiful? Uh, what, why is this so strong here? Because it's been set up in such and such a way over several chapters, uh, the repetition of sounds, the repetition of ideas, things like that. Uh, learn their tricks and model yourself. Uh, there's nothing wrong with modeling yourself on, on, um, on other writers as well. I mean, if, 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 uh, if another writer who's successful did it, then you can do it, you know? It's not, uh, sometimes people think if they're, you know, they think, oh, it's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, copying somebody, I'm just, uh, you know, imitating. Well, well, look, I mean, you know, you, you, as I say, the same story's been told a thousand ways, you know? It's how you want to tell it. Uh, what point of view can you tell it from? What if you, you know, what if you tell it from the point of view of the victim instead of the murderer or a you know, point of view of, you know, there have been people who tried to write from the point of view of a dog and something. I reviewed one one time. It was a terrible book. But, uh, and I said so. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, uh, but I never like to meet the guy in an alley, I think. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what was the, there was that uh, mo uh, book a few years ago, The Lovely Bones, told from the point of view of the ghost. I mean, it's really, it's really, uh, you know, at the time, it, it, people said, oh, how original, how, you know, well, it's not original. You could probably find a thousand examples of it going back to the 1700s, you know. Uh, uh, but that's fine, you know, as long as it, it seems like it's, uh, it's uh, yours. You know, you put you put your uh, put your claim on it, but you look at other. I, you know, I uh, I am supposedly somewhat annoying 
because of the way I look at movies and things and, and, uh, and have a way of knowing how they're going to come out because of the way they're being set up, you know, I mean that these structural things repeat. And, and, and you just sit there and go, well, okay, uh, it can't be him because, you know, he can't be the murderer because this reason, you know, and he can't, be, you know, and it could be any one of the following three. I, I th personally, I find a lot of murder mysteries, you could hang it on almost anybody in the book, uh, uh, that they're supposed to be logical and rational, and there could be only one suspect who did it, you know, and, and you think, no, nah, the other guy, could, you know, I mean, if you're, but it, it, it's the process of getting to that point that's the pleasure of most mysteries. It's not that. Um, if you're if you're writing and you're going to try to uh, to uh, publish in the traditional way, um, you need to, uh, especially as a beginner, to think some kind of category. Um, I got lucky. I wrote that book without really fully knowing that I was writing a mystery. You know, I, I, I thought, well, there's a murder in it, and there's a German officer investigating it, and that's sort of like Night of the Generals, but not exactly. And and uh, and then there's a lot of suspects, and then, you know, there's. But I left in a lot of ambiguity, and the editor basically told me, no, you're going to clear some of that stuff up because people will be irritated. You know, I said, but I'm, you know. But the reason I had all that ambiguity is because I wasn't thinking of it as a mystery. Then they go nominate me for a mystery prize, and I'm going to renting the tux for it, and I suddenly thought, oh, guess I'm a mystery writer. You know, it's like, duh. You know, so so I, I accepted it and 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 went on with it. Well, when they don't know your name out there, uh, they do know what a mystery is, or a romance is, or a, or a, or a historical novel, or a or you know, they know what that is. And people buy books based on this. You know, they say, they say, oh, I like I like cozy mysteries. You know, and and uh, I don't read anything else. Well, uh, you know, you go in the bookstore and they got a rack and it says cozy mysteries, you know, and people are, you know, trying other authors there and so forth. Up in the front, they got, you know, the big names are all on there because people are buying the brand name, Stephen King, you know, uh, James Patterson, uh, Ann Tyler, you know, whoever. It's, they're buying the name, but that came after a long process. Uh, you want to try to figure out what kind of category you can pull in. You're not being inferior to do this. Just write a better category book than anybody else and, and uh, use them as models, you know. Yeah, use them as models uh, uh, that, that on pay, you know, you realize that, uh, that um, you know, the w okay, this guy fine, you know. I, I did a Law and Order book. And, and one time, and I talked to the guy at Law and Order quite a bit, and he said, oh, one of the fun things we do is have to figure out ways to discover a body, you know. And you realize every episode of Law and Order began with the discovery of a body. And there'd be a couple of typical New Yorkers walking along, you know, and, and they'd be telling, complaining about the dog sitter or something, and then, and, oh, what's that? You know, and, and those people are out of the show after that. For, they have nothing to do with anything. Um, uh, but he said, you know, after, after 10 years, they were having a hard time figuring out how to come up with bodies how to discover bodies. But the fact is, that was the way the show worked. And so, so they had a model that they followed. Now, the thing is, if you, you know, had, you know, had been asked to write for them or something like that, you would have to find a way to come up with a body. And the cleverer you were, the better you'd be. There's nothing wrong with also doing it the way that others have done it. It's just, it's just that, uh, that it cre your readers have certain expectations, and if they don't know who you are, they want those expectations fed. And so it's not non-creative to do that. What happens is you get very creative in the box. You, know, you start thinking, okay, well, let's see. They found a body behind a dumpster. That's not so good. Where could they find it behind that maybe, oh, it's the plywood. Yeah, you know, you just, got, you know, you just keep 
spinning it out till you find something. But and the final thing is, I mean, I mean, the the the, the the issue of this is that, that it's, whatever this means, it's the quality of the writing that matters. I mean, that, that editors read a lot of stuff. And when they pick up a manuscript and they look at it, it's got to be something that engages them right away. And this is not usually the story. The story is, uh, you know, it can be the story but they'd have to read the whole thing to get the story, right? So, so there has to be something going on on the first page that catches them. Um, uh, and and uh, it has to be partly what's going on, but it's also largely the quality of the writing, the composition itself, uh, that you have to make that as good as possible. You have to work at that. When you write, you have to try to be better. You know, and, and you write, and you write, and you write. And then suddenly one day you find this groove, you know, and, and you're doing your best, you know, and, and then you try to improve on that. I mean, think about it. Nobody has to read fiction. I mean, why do they read it? They're reading it to find some pleasure out of it. Nobody has to read it. I mean, they have to read books for work, and you know, or, or they have to read, read the, you know, the the, the in order to understand someone's political view, they, or, or to understand how to put the washing machine together. I, I mean, they have to read for those reasons, but they don't have to read fiction. So you have to give them something. You have to be, you have to entertain them. You have to give them something. And part of that is playing with language. We, we often don't appreciate that enough. We worry about the big idea. And, you know, in the case of, the, <laughs> of Ms. Faust, uh, they worried so much about the big idea, they didn't realize it was badly written until it was published. And then it was, and it was full of typos too, it was a dreadful uh, thing. But, uh, but it was just, you know, uh, people would read it because we were all friends of this guy, you know. He'd say, did you read his book? You know? <laughs> uh, what'd you think, you know? Oh, I thought it had some interesting moments, you know? <laughs> I thought it was lousy, you know. <laughs> Don't tell him. You know. <laughs> I've got to have. I've got to teach with him later. Uh, <laughs> you know. Like, uh, but but uh, a lot of that was just basically the kind of the, uh, the the sentences, the word order, the how things are presented. Uh, does uh, is something going on on the first page? There's a lot of a lot of people's uh, writers say uh, they write, start writing the book, write the first chapter, then throw it out. These are, these are, you know, professional mystery writers, I know. So because they're still getting things straight in their head, you know. But what, they, what you want, to go back to Aristotle, uh, start in medius race, as they call it. Begin in the middle of things. And he pointed that out, that the Odyssey and the Iliad both begin in the middle of the story. They don't begin at the beginning of the story. You, you figure out where the beginning is, and then you start after that, Elmore Leonard said one time. And so, so the guy is already bankrupt. You know, you don't, don't, uh, don't, you don't have to work his way up to bankruptcy so that he can then rob a gas station. You, you, you have him bankrupt on the first page, and then he gradually comes to rob a gas station, so that you're in the middle of an ongoing problem. Um, well. Uh, the, 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 that's enough of that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd be happy to take questions or take a little break if you'd like a break, uh, a few minutes. Does anybody want a break? Okay. I think we're okay. Are you guys okay? All right. No, okay. I would like to ask, what's your process like now? How many hours a day do you write? Well, you know, I, if you really concentrate on it, it, I don't understand people who can write 10 hours a day. I, I just, it's, it's, I would die. I mean, it would just, I would just, it would be like hooking up my, you know, uh, bloodstream to, to, the, to the James River. I mean, it, it, it's just, so uh, I, think, I think about three hours, three or four hours is as much as I can handle it, you know. I can spend a lot of time sitting there thinking, and of course the internet's a horrible uh, thing. Uh, but but uh, 
you know, oh, what's Trump up to now? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, but but uh, but yeah, uh, uh, sit down and and really go at it for. But you know, there's a story about James Thurber that one time he was at a cocktail party, sort of standing in the middle of the room, holding his drink and just kind of. And his wife charged up to him and said, Thurber, stop writing. <laughs> you know, that, um, if, you, if you work on it steadily, it's always going on in a way. I mean, it's always, it's the, the actual sitting there is a different thing. And how did you uh, have the body discovered? Um, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> 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 uh, let's, I, I, you know, I don't really remember. Um, oh, there were a couple of, uh, uh, there's an Armenian guy arguing with his wife, and, uh, oh, they opened the door of a hotel room, and there's a body in there. It's not, <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> yeah, it's not great, but. But that's very law and order. It also allows the uh, a, ho a hotel room to be the forensic crime scene, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, it 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 was a lot of fun because you had to use their characters and they had to approve it. So you weren't allowed to go too far away from the television show. But television isn't written like novels, so it provided. A, there was somebody who was supposed to write one before me and and they just kept saying it's not law and order it's something else and he kept saying well you know characterization is important in a novel and and they would say there are th this will interest you probably they said there are no characters in law and order and i i said what you know i mean what and i thought about it and if you watch law and order there's very little stuff in which you discover somebody's background or something about as much as you get is you know Lenny Briscoe says I had a wife who used to do that once in a while you know <laughs> something like that so you realize he's been married before but but there's no story there it's it's very different if you watch straight up law and order and then watch special victims unit special victims unit is all about their personal problems you know law and order is not it's about the idea, and that makes it unusual, and and also makes it a little difficult to write as a novel, because you don't get the usual. Dick Francis told me once. He said, he said if I didn't if I didn't make up a character, I couldn't fill up the book. You know, so he said that's why he had a different detective in every book, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which was almost true. There was a question back there. I'm, I'm a potter, and one of my better selling vases is a vase that has on it the first lines of major novels. Oh, yeah? How do you arrive at that first sentence to grab that editor? I do, uh, well, you know, it's, oh, it's the mysterious power of the muse. I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I, I just, uh, Nathaniel, I, I, I was teaching at a, at a community college one time. We taught some Nathaniel Hawthorne. And, and I remember reading that he said once that uh, uh, he heard a little voice. And of course, all the students decided that meant he was insane. <laughs> but uh, I thought, well, I'm insane too. Um, uh, yeah, I sort of hear it, you know, and it, it has a certain resonance or something when I find it, you know. But I'll try and try different ones until it sort of materializes, you know. Uh, it has to be something that immediately leaps into the next sentence so that the paragraph then leaps into the next paragraph and so on. And I'm not talking about, you know, thriller diller stuff. I mean, you know, where, oh, it, you can't put it down, that sort of, I'm talking, emotionally it works that way too. You've got a person with a problem, you try to get the reader interested in the problem and they'll read on a little further. You just want them to read a little further, and then a little further, and then a little further. And if you get them far enough in there, they'll go the rest of the way, you know. Um, but usually it's, uh, you've got to embed some kind of conflict or something in, in it, or some kind of oddness that will make, make the reader want to find out what that is, you know. Um, and 
I don't know. It, it's something. It's something you 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 uh, recognize after a while, you know. But it may not be the same. It may not be the same for another person. But you know, or it's a, you can give people the same story and they'll write it in radically different ways because of who they are. Do you use an outline when you start a novel or when you think about a novel or? I, I do because, it, it, you, know, you know, people say, well, don't use an outline, it restricts your creativity. No, you, it's an outline, you know, it's not, it's not the book, you know. You, you, but what an outline does, there are several things an outline does for you, one of which is it gives you, uh, you know, there are going to be days when you sit down and go, uh, you know, and you can't come up with anything. Uh, the outline says what the next step is. You at least know what the next step is. Uh, um, you, it also allows you to sort of see the book as a whole because you're going to experience it as you write it, sentence by sentence, word by word. You're going to spend all day writing four pages, you know. That would be a good day. You write four pages, you know. And, and uh, by your, the time you're halfway through the book, you're going to be a little bored with your own book, you know. Well, the outline at least gives you something to, to keep working on, and, but also, ah, now's the time to begin curving toward the conclusion, you know, or, uh, or this doesn't belong there, you know, and, and, and take it out or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I do, I do. I don't do, I've known some people who do these incredibly detailed outlines well, that's too much like writing for me. I, I you know, I, I tend to have scrappy little notes. Uh, quite often I'm looking for an envelope that has a coffee stain on it that uh, has uh, that idea I had for chapter five or something. But, um, but yeah, I do use an outline. I do, I'm very, uh, I'm very much influenced, you know, the, the Aristotle did influence. I mean, he says plot is more important than anything else. And people have objected to that and said, oh, plot-driven novels as if it's an inferior form or something. But there's, you know, name me a good novel that doesn't have a, have a plot, you know, that's ridiculous. Uh, uh, and he says, basically, the character, character is secondary to plot. Character is a function of plot. And uh, people object to that horribly, too, you know. But the fact is that he's somewhat right that if the plot works out, you get an emotional reaction of a certain type that, that uh, you won't get if it's just sort of, you know, is your real life a plot? No, you know. Things happen. I told you the weird story of getting published, you know. Is that a plot? It's not a plot because one thing doesn't, you know, cause the next in a regular way. Accidents happen. You know, Michael Boudreaux's at a cocktail party. You know, what did I, you know, I'm the main character. How do I have anything to do with that? Nothing, you know. Uh, but we don't, we, but, you know, fiction is art, and we want it to work in a certain way, you know. We want it to feed us in a certain way and give us, uh, feed us those expectations we have. And so, you know, you have to do a lot of thinking about the different, you can say, it really happened, but it really happened this way, you know, and well, so what? I don't believe it, you know, whereas for some reason, you know, I'm willing to believe that there's a planet far away that these people are, you know, growing mushrooms on or something. I mean, why would I believe that? You know, it's not even credible. Uh, uh, and yet, if it's presented in a certain way, it's believable, you know. Whereas you've all heard, you know, amazingly weird true life stories, you know. You just, you just can't believe that, that such a thing happened, you know. And, and, uh, and you know, the Internet's a specialty of, of little weird things that, have, that can be verified. You know, John Tyler's grandsons are still alive, you know. Uh, they are, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, they were a very late reproducing family. Again. But uh, uh, you know, and those kinds of things come up in that way. But uh, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I forgot where the I wandered far from the question, which, which you don't want to do when you're writing a novel. <laughs>
Yes. You have an extensive foundation educationally for writing. Do you feel that's necessary to become a, a, a good writer? An expensive foundation? Uh, extensive. Oh, <laughs> hey, I went so long ago it was cheap, you know. <laughs> Back in the days when states used to give money to the. Um, no, I. It, it depends on what you mean by an education, you know. I mean, I've known some writers who, who, uh, who barely got through high school, but they spent a lot of time learning about life, you know. I mean, uh, uh, you got, I don't think you can be a good writer uh, without reading a lot. I mean, a lot, you know. I mean, just, uh, I think some of us may read more than we realize if we take it as a pleasure. You know, we, we, we but, but um, you know, because in some ways, if you're going to write, you're trying to recapture the pleasures that you got yourself from reading certain things, you know. And then sometimes, you know, if you, you read a book and, you, you know, it just knocks you out, but you realize you could not write it yourself because it's just not your personality, you know that kind of thing. I mean, you know, yeah, War and Peace is great, but, you know, I, I, I couldn't write that. Um, uh, so I, I do, th it's, you know, it depends what you mean by education, you know. I mean, um, a, lot of, a lot about fiction that, that sometimes is underrated, too, is, is uh, and sometimes overrated, I have to say, too, but is, is uh, knowing things, you know. I mean, that if you want to write about, you know, uh, Dick Francis was a jockey and he wrote about being a jockey, you know. And when he broke a bone in the, in the, in the books, you could feel it because he'd broken bones like, you know, falling off those horses. He said he broke his, each collarbone at least six times. You know, and when he broke a rib, he said he he because he didn't get paid if he didn't ride, he'd uh, sort of tape it up and go in there, and the doctor would say, "Did you get hurt there? Did you get hurt? Nah, nah, fine, fine." <laughs> <You know. laughs> but but he would he would go ahead and do it. Now, so he knew you know in a he wasn't you know he didn't know about how to murder somebody or something, but but uh, but that background the backdrop of the horses and so on was a big big part of it and sometimes it's it's uh, hard to realize what your own into you take for granted your own background you know and don't realize that it could be interesting to other people if it were presented in the proper way i mean i realized when i suddenly thought oh i'm a mystery writer duh um uh that when i was a kid Perry Mason, you know, we watched Perry Mason. We, we, you know, I, I, I would if if I had a choice between two movies, I'd watch some kind of mystery movie, you know. No matter how stupid it was, you know, and there are a lot of stupid ones. Uh, nine, what is it? The Theodore Sturgeon, the science fiction writer, said ninety nine percent of everything is crud, uh, which which uh, is is called Sturgeon's rule now. But uh, it's true, 99% of books is are no good, really. <laughs> or not very memorable, you know. <laughs> and what, But the 1% is the what you're looking for, you know. And, of course, you want to write the 1% if you're lucky, but you won't, probably won't know when you do it, you know. That's the, that's the thing. Um, so I wouldn't say, you know, I mean, I, I, I would say, though, that when I was, you know, doing my English Ph.D., because you got to have a job, you know, that helps. Um, uh, when I was doing my English PhD, I did a lot of reading of, uh, of, of Shakespeare and Johnson and, and uh, you know, I mentioned Hawthorne and, and Poe and everybody. And here's the thing, though. I was reading them differently than the people in my class. The people who were reading them for hidden meanings and literary... I was, I was noticing how Shakespeare made... An even evil character appealing, you know, about how he would suddenly make you feel sorry for for Shylock when Shylock was engaged in tremendous cruelty, you know, and and uh, and how did he do that, you know, 
and, and uh, how did he make people so complex with just a few words, you know? And I would be looking at it that way, you know? Uh, and, and that was a little different. I mean, uh, reading Shakespeare will never hurt anybody, you know? <laughs> if you just read it in the right way. Uh, uh, I, ha I was lucky to have a professor who said, he said, don't read the footnotes. Don't read the footnotes. Don't try, he said, I don't want you to try to understand every sentence because you won't. He said, if you re just read one of the plays straight through and then read the second, by the third play, you got the thing. You know, you got the rhythm, you got it. And this particular sentence, you don't care about. You, know, uh, you, you just skip over it just like somebody said something odd, you know, and you just don't do it like that. So, uh, you know, you have to read with the idea of educating yourself to write, I guess, and that's, that's part of it. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily that the academic route is a great one, <laughs> but yes. You. Um, so what category would you say your mysteries are and about what's the average length of time you would take to write one? Well, they vary, actually. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the first one was very was non-traditional. I realized that probably helped get me in the running for the prize, you know, because people who are judging these are reading a great pile of them, and oh, here's another one: detective gets framed with his gun, you know, and off like that. Whereas the setting was different, the, the idea was different. The whole uh, I didn't even think of the murder as being important in the thing, except that it set up the, the conflict, but. Um, uh, so I would say I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, non-traditional in certain ways. I mean, obviously the Law and Order book is a Law and Order book. Uh, I wrote a book uh, in association with the Alfred Hitchcock estate, which was a thrill for me because I used to love Alfred Hitchcock Presents. You know, um, it was about the only television show based entirely upon quality short stories. Every every episode was a short story that had been published, you know, and some of them were really fantastic stories. And um, um, but then uh, they said, "Well, can you write a mystery novel with Alfred Hitchcock as a character?" You know, and I said, uh, "Yeah, you know, oh sure, how much?" And uh, <coughs> you know, and that one is pretty much a traditional hardball detective. Hitchcock hires a guy, and I kind of thought of it, wait a minute, you know what the model here is, Nero Wolf. It's, it's the, the big fat guy in his house, right? And, and then the detective who goes out and finds the details and brings it back to him, and Nero Wolf solves a case, right? Well, Alfred Hitchcock sends the guy out, the guy goes, da, 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 comes back with the stuff, Alfred Hitchcock solves the case, right? Uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun, it was a lot of fun. and. Um, uh, but it was also a situation where somebody else was supposed to write it and messed it up, and they they said, "How quickly can you do this?" You know, <clears throat> and so I needed a very definite pattern to kind of use, and and you can't remake the wheel if you don't have the time to do it, and um, and I just did it that way, and I did it in you know in a very short period of time. But uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to do that. Yeah, you were trying earlier. I read that you're writing a, or you just finished a book about a woman detective in 19 something. Well, yeah, I just, just finished. Uh, it's sort of, uh, my idea is it's a three book series, but, but um, it's about um, uh, the first woman detective, first municipal woman detective. Uh, it was hired by in New York City in 1912 uh, and um, immediately solved a, a case known as the Great Taxi Cab Robbery um, and uh, d did a lot of work on uh, con artists and stuff like that. But um, yeah, they hired, the, she was a police matron, which uh, meant she was basically down in the jails to to, to keep the uh, women prisoners from being attacked by the cops. And uh, they'd had some scandals and, you know, they, they hired these matrons. 
well, the matrons got lousy pay and all this kind of stuff. But but anyway, Mrs. Goodwin, Isabella Goodwin, was was uh, then hired to be a detective, and shortly after that, they hired another one, Mary Sullivan, who wrote a memoir. But uh, 1912, it turns out to be a pretty interesting year, you know, where where uh, the Titanic sank, um, um, Roosevelt ran as an independent for president. Um, uh, the mayor of New York had <clears throat> just survived being shot in the throat. Uh, and it's, it's considered to be the first live news photo or something. He's actually standing there, blood running down his arm. He didn't die until 1913 uh, when he was on a cruise. Well, when the bullet finally moved or something, they couldn't remove it. Um, um, what else? Oh, Tammany Hall and, and cr organized... Crime is not exactly organized yet, but it's getting there, you know. Um, uh, and it's kind of interesting. There are gangs that dominate neighborhoods, and the neighborhoods are very ethnic. You know, there's, this one's Italian, this one's uh, African-American, this one's, you know, uh, like that. Uh, and it's police, which had gone through a uh, non-corruption thing in the early part of the century, was suddenly now pretty much back where it was with, uh, when Clubber Williams, a police captain, used to go beat money out of people <laughs> and held his job for years. Had no problem. <laughs> There's a cop. What do you want? You know, beat, beat him up, you know. Uh, so that's, that's what, basically it's about her and about her getting along with her family and her Writing from her viewpoint though. So I was wondering how a man could write from a woman's viewpoint. Um, oh, don't get me started on that. Uh, um, I, 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 I'm not sure that, you know, I'm sure that, that in many areas we think differently. But I think, uh, you know, uh, you pick, pick the man out who thinks like I do, and I'll, I'll be surprised too. Um, but, but uh, no, I, I, it's basically, it was a real challenge because it's done, um, how can I say, it was originally... When it was originally sort of suggested, it was proposed as a mini-series, right? So I began thinking of it in the same way I think of The Sopranos, The Wire, Boardwalk Empire, particularly Boardwalk Empire, where it goes from character to character and you get, you know, it's basically, it's like that. You go from one character and a situation to another character and a situation and then and and gradually the whole story develops it's it's tricky but it it's uh it, that's what it was it's more of a camera eye than it does say what people are thinking and so forth and that she's she feels bad because her daughter she missed her daughter's birthday or something you know but but uh it's i wouldn't say it's really into their point of view particularly yeah but i would like to know when you when they decide to print it do you have anything to say about the cover and the printing? And no. That's all. No. And, and uh, I had a friend who once insisted that he had cover control, and they redid his cover, and they released the book late. And when they released it late, uh, the reviews were all dead and stuff, and he said never would he even ask for this. Uh, I mean, this, this is one of the things about like now we get a lot of electronic self-publishing and that kind of stuff. Okay, that's fine. If it's nothing succeeds like success, you know, if if it sells well and so on. But I don't know anything about cover design, you know? I just knew they made my name too small on that. You know, I mean, uh, that's about it. Um, uh, I don't know anything about cover design. I don't know anything about marketing. I mean, I should be worried about the writing. And, and I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I can just worry about the writing and not worry about the, uh, the other stuff. If I had to worry about the other stuff, it would take time away from the writing and so on like that. Um, uh, no, they have people who are experts at designing covers, you know, and I've been uh, quite astonished talking to some of them, you know. Uh, they po he pointed out some things about, like one guy pointed out that there's something called the eye design in which, in which the things are arranged on the front so that if viewed from a distance and kind of blurry, it looks like an eye. And that across the bookstore, you'll, 
you know, we naturally look at something. That, yeah, you know, it's like, uh, uh, we look over there, you know. Uh, uh, we can't avoid, you know, I, you know, in movies when they want someone to be saying something powerful, they want both eyes shown and the other person will be turned because you will look at the person whose eyes you can see rather than the person who's, you know, stuff like that. But uh, like, oh, well, that's fascinating. And color balance and things like that. I've had covers I thought were terrible. I've had covers I thought were, were, were really clever. But I don't want to even bother with it. I don't even want to think about it. Yeah, I mean, some people say, oh, well, I want to control my cover. You know, I, I, I knew several writers who did that, and they mostly rooted. They just thought, and you can never tell why a book sells and why it does, you know. I mean, for sure, you know, you hope that it's because of the quality of your writing, but, but you, you, you know, then you read Da Vinci Code, and no, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible book. <laughs> I'm wondering, as, as a mystery writer, and you talk about plot-driven movies, if you were to pick your favorite mystery movie of all time, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> oh. I, I, you know, the other day I thought, people always ask, what's your favorite book and what's your, and I, and I should have an answer. Um, I'd have to think about it. Uh, as far as a mystery movie, um, uh, I, I hate this because I know I'm going to go get out of here and think, oh, I should have said, da, 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 da. Um, my absolute favorite movie is Casablanca, um, which is not a mystery, really. But, um, I don't know, Witness for the Prosecution. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I would, I, you know, if, it, if, I, if I'm flipping channels and it's on, I'll watch a scene or two. You, it won't watch the whole thing. But, but you know, Charles Lawton's character and uh, it's, uh, the trick is okay, but, you know, but uh, Tyrone Power and so on. So I like that. Um, uh, and there's, there's a number of others, I guess. I mean, uh, that have some sort of crime basis, but you wouldn't think of them as mysteries. Like like, uh, like M. M is horrifying and fascinating. I mean, it just, it's just so strange, uh, you know, uh, about a child killer and, and, and Peter Lorre, and it's just, it's just a very strange movie. Um, there's, there's some, uh, uh, I'm thinking there's probably a French movie or two in there too, because I watched a lot of French movies at times. I had some friends from France who used to send me some DVDs from there. Had to go buy a special, you know, they got that locked up. You gotta go to a special DVD player because DVDs made in France won't play on our machines. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's a way of chopping up the world, you know. <laughs> it's foolish, I mean, it, you know, it's, I'm going to watch this Br British uh, subtitled French movie and I have to buy another machine to do it. That's <laughs> crazy. Um, what else? I, I, I don't know. I, I, if, if somebody started listing off movies, I would, rea you know, I, I, I'd go, oh, that one, yeah, you know. But, but just off the top of my head, I have a hard time doing that. In the way back, it looks like something. I just wanted to know what was the relationship between your teaching and your writing? Like, is the teaching sometimes painful, discouraging, or is it exhilarating and a nice break from the writing? Or what's the relationship? Well, it, you know, it, you, you, you vacillate. I mean, sometimes <clears throat> what I discovered usually when I was at the University of Oklahoma teaching novel writing is that usually out of 20 people, there'd be two people working on something you thought really stood some chance, you know. And there'd be other people who just, I guess, were hobbyists or something, you know. I mean, or hadn't gotten there yet. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't beat up anybody and tell them they were terrible and, you know, that kind of stuff. Some of them were, but, the, you know. Uh, but the really terrible ones, that's kind of an art, too. I mean, you know, they're, they're rare, too. I had one guy who who was just dull, you know? I don't know what it was, but he could write the dullest sentences you could imagine, you know? And and I would say, you gotta have a little more oomph in here, you know, something, you know? And he'd rewrite it and it would be 
dull again, you know. I don't know what it was. He ended up being a reporter somewhere, <laughs> you know. He actually writes for a living, I guess, you know. It, from what I could tell, his newspaper articles weren't any more exciting than his, uh, than his fiction. But um, uh, usually there were a couple of people who'd sort of give you give you a good feeling. Uh, but you read an off, uh, you know, you'd read an awful lot of manuscripts, uh, and you'd have to adjust to this, you know, because because you'd have to because you have to think about your own writing in a different way than you think about how you're going to advise someone to improve something, you know. Uh, a lot of people would get very alarmed when I would say something like. Uh, Oh, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of Murder on the Orient Express. And they go, oh, no, I don't have an original idea. You know, and I go, no, 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 don't worry about that, you know. <laughs> the ones I really, the ones I really hated were the people who had these great ideas and we're never going to finish them. You know, it just, there were some, there were, you know, every, every two years there was at least one that I'd want to steal, you know. <laughs> the, the idea, not the text. I mean, you know, I... I I thought that was the funniest thing when they remade DOA. That's that's another mystery movie I like. The, but I like the old one. The the new one is a is a laugh. I mean, it's a laugh because it's a writing professor who murders somebody because the guy has written a uh, a best-selling novel. It's like yeah, you pick up a no manual and you know it's going to be a bestseller to the certainty that you would murder someone for it. I mean, it's like, that's ridiculous. Nobody, you know, people, nobody knew Da Vinci Code was gonna be a bestseller. You know, nobody knew, yeah, they they made a guess and they took a chance and they, they did it. But but uh, yeah, there would be these ideas. There was one that was just, oh. And every time I saw this guy on campus, I'd say, hey, have you been, you know. oh, well, I'm, I'm waiting for, you know, the end of spring when I can, you know. I'm waiting for when I have a cabin and can look out at the lake. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, no one ever wrote that. You know, I mean, oh, what's it? Mary Roberts Reinhardt had uh, was an old mystery writer of the 30s and 40s, and she uh, she had a lot of children, evidently, and wrote on her ironing board because the children would stay away from the ironing board because they could get, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but she would stand at her ironing board. And, Right, and and and, uh, and uh, uh, my my dad. I, I remember my dad was always crazy about Mary. He liked Mary Roberts Reinhardt because uh, because she was kind of funny. She had these ticks, you know, and and one of the ticks was little did he know, you know, yeah, Bob was happy now. The the uh, the trees were fruiting and and everything was lo little did he know that by tomorrow he would be dead, you know. <laughs> And that's how she would end a chapter. So. <laughs> so, anything else? Yeah. How much research do you put into your, into your novels for your characters, your topics? Well, uh, uh, you ha I put in a lot, but it's not, like, if I'm writing about 1912, like I, I am, the thing to try to research is how people lived, not not the history, you know? I mean, somebody picks up the paper and says, oh, look, the Titanic sank, you know? And, and I actually discovered that some papers said everyone has been rescued. Uh, some papers said John Jacob Astor is missing, and then the others said, you know, it was, you know, that's what they knew that day. The idea is find out what they knew that day, and not, not sort of, and did they even know Titanic, you know? I mean, you know, it's like, oh, it's a big ship, you know, and it's a big deal to us. If someone mentions Titanic, we go, oh, Titanic, you know. But but at the time, there were a lot of ships crossing the ocean and stuff, and, and it was pretty, you know, it was well advertised. But if you were an ordinary person running a grocery store, uh, I'm more interested in what was the ca uh, cost of a can of beans, you know. Uh, or or uh, or how did you how did you clean windows you know and that kind of stuff is not you know when I was doing the books that had a, to do with World War II uh, a lot, newspapers were a great help you could see you know what was being advertised and 
what were the fashions and, and uh, what people were preoccupied with. You know, uh, uh, there was a lot of soy cereal I noticed being sold. I bet that was yummy, but because the meat was going to the war, you know, and stuff like that, you know, uh, you want to try to figure out what ordinary life was like so that your characters can seem real. Um, and then, you know, it, it, somebody living in, uh, you know, Germany in the 30s would notice Hitler, you know, but, but you know, it, before Hitler takes over, What's your attitude toward him, you know? And so, so it's that kind of peculiar research. Sometimes novels are helpful for that if they're written contemporary to the time. Um, uh, and I know, you know, some mystery writers are obsessive about details, about guns and things like that, because their audience kind of expects it, you know? I think with historical novels that people like to have a little bit of, you know, learn a little something, you know? But, but they don't want a whole page of information about medieval armor, you know. Uh, you will find books like that, but, but uh, where it's just basically page after page of research notes. <laughs> you know? And uh, no, get, get the story going and keep it going, you know. That's, that's the point. That's the point. And, and uh, save your index cards for later, you know, uh, maybe. It's, it's also difficult sometimes, uh, I have to say, to try to understand how somebody who's in a situation taking that stuff for granted, how you can get it explained to people who don't know, you know? Uh, there's these awful scenes in these things, you know, that says, well, Timmy, let me explain to you how the steam engine works, you know? <laughs> it's, it's totally unlikely that a guy would explain to a kid at, at that point, you know, the kid would say, well, how, do, how, does the, how do the wheels go? He said, well, we put the fire in there and it goes. You know, I mean, it, it wouldn't get into, well, there's a pipe here, another here, you know. And, 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 you know, that's when you feel like you're reading index cards. And, and you, it's no fun. But, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, do, I think it's a, a similar trick for writing science fiction. You have to have people taking for granted things that we could never take for granted, but we have to understand what's going on, you know, and and uh, and because otherwise we can't understand the story. You know? So it's it's a tricky business. Yeah, yeah. You said that Aristotle started in the middle. Do you know the ending of your story before you start at the front? I usually do. It might change. But I, I don't, I, you know, it, you can waste an awful lot of time trying to figure out what the, you know, you could, you could get hundreds of pages and uh, 200 pages in there and suddenly not know where you're going. You know, I've, I've known people who did this and, uh, and, you know, say, well, someday I'll figure out how this ends. Well, actually, there should be a logical progression to the end. It shouldn't be really obvious so the reader, you know, 100 pages out and figures out, oh, yeah. yeah. But uh, oh bum, you know. But but um, but yeah, I do I do have an ending in mind. But you know, when I got to uh, well, like the murder of Frau Schutz, when I got uh, almost to the end, I started thinking about other people as being the murderer, you know. And for a while there, I was pretty confused. I knew I was going to have to pin it on one of them, but uh, but uh, uh, and then some, you know smart person came up to me and said, you know, I loved your book, but uh, I, I figured out who did it on page 50, you know. And I said, well, that's good, because I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're right. But yeah, I do, I, I do feel like I have to have a uh, vision of the whole thing before starting. Because, and and that, that can change, though, change so much. Uh, and you have to be open to that if you see a better, better possibility. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming, and thank you very much. This was very interesting. I know he has some books here if you want to look at them or come up and say something to him on your way out. And we'll have our next program in two months, and I'll be sending out information about that. But thank you all very much. Thank you.